using this. Okay, perfect. So hello everybody, and uh, thank you, Kat, for the great talk, and uh, of course everyone also before this morning. Um, it's a great honor to be uh, first time in B-Sides Budapest, not the first time in Budapest, uh, or s speaking to conferences in, uh, in Hungary in general, but always wonderful to be back in this lovely country and surroundings. So today I'm going to talk to you about, uh, the title is The Adversary Mindset, but essentially I'm very happy to be coming up right after a talk about honeypots and deceptions because this really will emphasize the mindset I want to speak about. And um, I'll show you in a second why this is, because I want to give you some practical examples, whether you are an offensive uh, 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 team player or, or a defensive one, uh, about how we can use this type of mindset to build better solutions. So first off, how many of you consider themselves uh, red teamers, uh, pen testers, or even in research at some point? Okay, how many of you are like pure Defensive blue teamers, sec ops, SOC analysts, whatever. Okay, perfect. So it's good because it's kind of a mixed audience and we have things for both audiences tonight. A bit about myself, I've been with computers for a while. Um, um, I've been, uh, like she mentioned, I know I'm a master CNE, nobody knows what it is, from the late 80s, uh, which is a novel certified whatever. Uh, but my first systems were OpenVMS and Vax, uh, and everything went uh, really complex since then. Uh, I'm co-founder of a company called Tenroot, um, doing services for Fortune 100, etc. And I've been around uh, with computers, like I said, for a while. I had a chance to work for Microsoft. I was the only guy with uh, Linux uh, when Steve Ballmer called Linux a cancer. Uh, this was fun to have a, a Lilo, a Lilo a dual boot and... Uh, uh, this was very fun, uh, and I've been around with Active Directory, uh, which is the Microsoft uh, version of uh, LDAP, centralized identities, etc. Uh, but in my spare time, I like to um, play the guitar, volunteer whenever I can, and just fly planes. Everything is more calm uh, from up there. Yeah. <laughs> Jumping out of planes also counts. <laughs> So what we're going to speak about, we're going to understand a bit uh, what it means, the adversary mindset. We're going to speak about what makes or breaks a successful cyber attack. Maybe not what you think. And then I'll give you some practical examples. So hopefully we'll come uh, pretty quickly bef after we understand uh, the idea, we'll come pretty quickly to the practical uh, demos. And I'm going to leave you in my GitHub with a lot of uh, open source tools and comments. So, what is the adversary mindset? So here is a four seconds video to explain. That's it. <laughs> Essentially, you learn uh, the system and you use the processes, uh, etc., against it, right? Because uh, no system is immune, nothing is unbreakable, uh, and there is, uh, we are not even close to 100% of protecting systems, right? And the adversary mindset is all about thinking how we can find this. When we ask our ourselves what makes or breaks a successful cyber attack is essentially a mindset. But I would uh, argue or at least suggest that it is an adversary mindset that is very much focused on time. Time can be if you want to co consume less time or save time, you want, need to be more stealthy or evasive if you want to be a fly on the wall on a network for weeks without being detected. And it can also be on the flip coin of that, it could be a defender mindset, very much focused on time. But then uh, the table gets turned, right? So with a defender mindset focused on time, we need to think about how we delay our attacker. Right? How we confuse our attacker, and now I'm, I can actually use the CCAD acronym from CAT's talk about that. Which is why I said, we're not synchronized, but it's, it just came out very well. Um, I would suggest this uh, very quick diagram. It, it took me longer to create this slide than it took me to write the code of the demos that I show you. <laughs> because um, slides are not my... Uh... But if you think about an anatomy of a potential uh, attack, stages versus the defense uh, uh, routine and controls. So uh, the 
defender, the organization lives in the zone of uncertainty. It's like a 24 seven, not really knowing uh, uh, what is happening in terms of cybersecurity. And the attacker leaves a window of opportunity, right? And normally this window of opportunity, uh, it will be hard to detect it very early unless you're using heavy tokens. But normally it begins with the point of entry, patient zero, the initial uh, access vector, and the organization joins uh, this potential uh, uh, attacker uh, process with the first detection. It's easy to see that the attacker opportunity window goes hand, with, hand by hand with the zone of uncertainty of the organization, which really means that if we are detecting uh, in few minutes, one hour, few days, or maybe you never detect it, maybe you detect it only after the data is exfiltrated or, or most of your data center is uh, uh, wiped or uh, uh, encrypted, etc. So it really comes to show that the longer the attacker opportunity window stretches and you are delaying with the detection, then uh, the window of opportunity, it's, it's all about time. And you need to be sure that you buy yourself as defenders, as blue teamers, you need to buy yourself as much time as possible. And one of the best ways to get everything in life is to get good tools, good processes without paying for them. And living off the land is one of those. Living off the land, I'm sure you probably heard about that. Who heard about this concept? Living off the land? Okay, most of you. That's great. So in living off the land, why, we, why introduce malware when you can use the uh, built-in system tools and commands, right? Uh, it doesn't matter the operating system, by the way, whether you're on, on uh, Linux, Mac, or, or Windows box. Uh, I'm going to show most of the examples on, on Windows because most of the customers use that. But in the living of the land mindset, you should really ask yourself for any uh, management uh, connection you're seeing. doesn't matter if it's an uh, SSH, WinRM, RDP, uh, PSExec, whatever. Is this a remote connection, like a remote management attempt or a lateral movement? Because this really is the same thing, uh, a legitimate uh, remote management action and a lateral movement by an attacker look on the surface of things in a, in a very simplistic way. They look exactly the same uh, in, in Wireshark and in the logs, etc. But it's only when you put a, a context perspective about them, like who did what, when, from where, and you try to see the anomaly, you can get somewhere. And I'll give you an example how you can play around living off the land and actually uh, change the way that uh, the detection uh, uh, the statistics in your favor. So interposex communication, you probably know that. Uh, it's, it's a form, when, when we look at least in Windows, interposex communications, they can pass strings and execute uh, code, local or remote, two-way, one-way, encrypted, not encrypted. It is very easy. This is a built-in mechanism. And uh, this way you can actually uh, exfiltrate data or create a full command and control. Now, uh, when we, we, you know, sometimes you will get this on a box when you're trying to run, a, a, to bind a, to a socket, right? But that's the beauty of interprocess communications because it uh, essentially rides SMB, at least in Windows operating system, it rides port 445, it's already open. So we don't need local admin privileges, we don't need to open a socket and essentially, uh, we get what we want without opening a firewall port. But then I ask you, why would you use like PSExec? Everybody knows the sys internal tools, PSExec, right? Essentially it works with name pipes, which is essentially uh, IPC, it essentially rise SMB. But why would you use PSExec, which is very noisy, it creates a lot of forensics, right? It creates a service, etc., uh, and not use uh, just a simple name pipe because that's what PS, PSExec does. It's a fancy name pipe uh, with a known signature uh, and a lot of uh, forensics. So we can actually create a simple name pipe with one line of code, built in living off the land with PowerShell, for example. And this really shows you the element of time. Time is really the most important measure when it comes to cybersecurity. So this is the one liner. Now I uh, created a new uh, NamePipe client stream and uh, you can see that it's a local stream because I have the dot there and what it's doing, it's just uh, opening a stream reader 
And while there is data, it's uh, executing the data. IEX is invoke expression. And uh, now I'm opening a different process on the same machine, and I'm opening a server stream, and I will just write to that uh, stream writer, and everything I write in the stream writer gets executed, right? It's like a file. But essentially, this pipe is everything I write to this pipe gets executed on the other process. And this is very easy because uh, it's also very, very hard for security products to tackle that. Because guess what? On your average Windows machine, you have uh, more than 300 of those pipes and you need them for basic operations like whatever, copy-paste. Uh, and now I will just change one uh, string I will just point to an IP address. This is my netcat, okay? <laughs> this is not a reverse shell that uh, Defender and all the virus, uh, antivirus software will block. This is a legit name pipe, right? And now I will show it from a different machine, and like I said, you don't need any permissions. And I open, again, a server stream, and everything I run in this side will get executed on the other side. Um, so what about detections? I, I promised you I will try to show red and blue. So Sadly, there is no ETW, event tracing for Windows provider, per se, to uh, do the uh, logging of the creation connection. You need actually to code or mini filter system, uh, driver. Uh, but luckily, some people did. There is one example. GitHub is always your friend. Uh, but then there are other ways. So you can actually observe, observe all the name pipes because essentially it creates a handle like everything else. Uh, you can turn on monitoring in the auditing for all the handle manipulations. This will create the very noisy event ID 4656, uh, which is very hard to sniff through and find the needle in the haystring. But you can also use Sysmon. Sysmon for a while has had the pipe event uh, on the XML configuration. You can add it. It's still very, very noisy because, like I said, it's part of the uh, the land, the living of the land of Windows. But you can also, uh, if you have an SMB server, you can also monitor for SMB open files starting with the prefix of a backslash. And because when you look at open files, a, a name pipe is a file, and when it's a, a file opened from the network, you will see the local file is being opened by this and that IP, etc. But if you see a prefix of backslash, this is a name pipe. And to see that on a, on a server, that's actually uh, quite unique. So always try to look about what stands out. I want to speak a bit about uh, Windows' favorite uh, admin tool, uh, ransom de ransomware deployment protocol. Uh, yeah, RDP, I really, you know, RDP is the gift uh, of uh, system admins, Windows sysadmins to, uh, to attackers, to adversaries, because this tool is underappreciated how vulnerable it is, and I will show you a few of the attacks. I want to first give you a defense example, then we'll show some offensive one. How you can use a time-focused example in RDP with living off the land. So, of course, nobody uh, here uh, ever opened by mistake an RDP server to the internet, not in your uh, Azure or, or AWS or VPS environments. Uh, but if you do, I will tell you what happened to my honeypot uh, when I opened one of those. Uh, it was up uh, less than four hours. Um, so when you get uh, something like that, I will tell you what happens. What happened is around 40,000 failed RDP logon events, right? Uh, out of those events, uh, around 15,000 of them, username does not exist. Uh, I got uh, all the statistics, yeah, from all the countries, etc. Admin, temp, system, support, there is all those that they try instead of administrator. But most of the events, hands down, straightforward, were the legitimate uh, root user administrator in the Windows operating system case, right? So username was correct, but they tried to guess the password uh, more than 24,000 times. After renaming the administrator to whatever key combination on the keyboard, then I reran the honeypot again. This time, uh, almost the same number of failed event log uh, logon events, even more. But this time, all events were from the category, category username does not exist, which means that I didn't even get one real attempt of password guessing. Now, this is not uh, rocket science. It's very simple, and you don't need even to know cybersecurity. It just takes common sense to rename an account and to have that in the 
a default image of every new server that you are provisioning in your environment, whether on-prem or cloud. Uh, but we can also take it to the next level. The next thing I did is I changed in the registry the port number, because obviously uh, scanners, bots, and maps, etc., they will look for 3389, the default RDP port, right? Uh, when they scan for uh, an authentication service like that, RDP, if you change the number to 500056, whatever, uh, you will not even get the legitimate scan, so we'll, they will not even try to authenticate. Think about how much time this delays your attacker and it gives you more time to your uh, SOC team, to your SIM and, and logs, to be filled with those uh, suspicious attempts that you can try and figure out, hey, somebody is trying to hack me. So the moral of those examples are, if it's a little harder for you, it is more hard for the attacker. Trust me, from years of trying and training. But if it's very convenient for you, if you're like breezing through that RDP connection without giving any uh, physical, uh, I don't know, FIDO token or whatever, uh, it is very, very easy for the attacker. Normally, we learn networks in a matter of uh, a very few uh, minutes, and uh, we know in like half an hour, we know the network better than the IT admins. And the main point here is time. Time is probably the only uh, security measurement unit that we can uh, relate to in cybersecurity because cybersecurity is not static, it's dynamic, it's not binary. Sure, we have binaries, but it's not zeros and ones. You don't uh, detect, contain, or prevent 100%, never. It's not a Boolean thing. And time is the only thing you can uh, strive for. I will ask you another question. Speaking about RDP hosts, how would you detect all the RDP hosts in a big network, like 15, 20, 30, 40,000? I saw networks of <laughs> millions of accounts, right? But how you, would you do that quickly and stealthy without scanning the entire network in, in a Microsoft domain, right? You have any idea how we do it? you do that and blend in, in the environment pretty perfectly? Shout out, yeah? other port scanning or, or sniffing the transport, etc. Well, that, that could work. And you could do also like a POF or like a passive scanning, things like that. But I, I can suggest uh, something that is uh, fairly a, a bit more uh, specific. You can actually query the SPN of Term SRV. You can use a, a built-in living off the land ADSI from any uh, OS that you fall into that account. And you can just uh, filter, these are all the SPNs, the Kerber service principle name. Did you know that when you add an RDP server to a Windows domain, it actually registers an SPN, a service principle name called Term SRV, Terminal Server. So now it's a very simple LDAP query, very uh, low, very small, and, and now I have all the RDP, even your Windows 10 machine, when you enable a remote desktop, it gets registered. You can extend it to other services. For example, WSMAN, WSMAN Web Services Management Protocol is essentially the WinRM, uh, when you open WinRM on machines. And you can also search for uh, any other SQL or whatever. So the defense tip coming from this is, living off the land style is just pretty much to customize it, right? As Kat said, those uh, dancing flamingos uh, know what they're doing. So extending the RTP port change tactic to any other protocol, essentially, and services. You can just customize your entire network, or at least your data center, or at least specific parts of sensitive data assets, and just create totally different random port numbers for SSH, LDAP, whatever you want. And more importantly, you can do that for any API or web service or whatever, but you monitor the normally accepted values. So you know that if somebody comes through in SSH in the port they think they, they are coming or RDP or whatever, uh, then you know th this is, um, uh, at minimum, it's a curious uh, user. <laughs> and it could be way worse than uh, a curious user. So in other words, defenders try to buy yourself time. Detection is hard and not everybody has the skills uh, or the mindset to do the hard work of real-time uh, detections like the guys, uh, Avi and Guy from Oligo are doing it with eBPF. 
So all the rest of you try to buy time. I'll give you another example, RDP attack in the middle. Have you ever got attacked by a, an RDP man in the middle? I mean, you wouldn't know if you did, right? I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it's super stealthy and the victim feels nothing. <laughs> I'll show you how it happens. Uh, so this is my Linux box on one side, and on the other side there is the jolly Windows admin trying to log in to the domain controller or whatever. And they put in the password. You can see something is beginning to happen on the box on the left, on the, on the, Windows, on the Linux box. Essentially, what is happening here is I'm trying to downgrade the session, uh, the session encryption. And what really helps is if I'm uh, spoofing this connection uh, and, uh, you know, using the, the MAC address in between those connections, between the victim and the client, first of all, I will always get the net NTLM, which is essentially the hash of the password. This I will always get because I tempered with the NTLM response. But now because RDP servers are using uh, self-signed certificates, which is essentially a certificate uh, without authority that uh, you, it, you cannot uh, verify it, like many other internal servers, this is a fake certificate. So I'm faking the uh, certificate, the server-side certificate, server authentication. And from this uh, point forward, I got the clear text password, of course, because I'm encrypting the session with my fake uh, certificate. And of course, everything you type on the clipboard and you send, uh, I will get a copy of that. And the only thing that the victim will feel is that the RDP connection took a bit longer than normally. This, of course, to see all this beauty, uh, this works, uh, the, this whole chain of net and TLM, clear text password, etc., works when you don't have NLA enforced. If you remember network level authentication, a few years back with the Oracle remediation, but still, NLA is the non-NLA is the default uh, authentication uh, in uh, RDP servers that are in OT environments, like Bojan, Bojan uh, mentioned, etc. Uh, so, if you use the same tactic, I show you the LDAP filter. Uh, you will do a re quick uh, discovery reconnaissance of all the RDP servers that uh, are vulnerable with NLA. But you don't have to settle for that. You can actually a downgrade the uh, NLA level and to get the clear text password from any server, even the latest uh, server 2022, 25 soon, etc. All you need to do is just use your normal uh, spoofer, relay, whether it's uh, responder, inway, and all those type of tools. But instead of uh, adding uh, your user to a local admin, uh, local administrator group, etc., try just to change this uh, registry key. So just uh, relay this command, uh, which is uh, a change that is less likely for uh, blue teamers to detect, detect that you, are, you uh, changed the network level authentication to disable from one to zero. They, they are more likely to detect if you run like Mimikatz or things like that. And now, uh, next time they will connect to the RDP, you will get the clear text password. So like I promised to the blue team, how can you mitigate that? So first of all, you try to enforce NLA, network level authentication on all connections with group policy. Uh, the slides will be available later, so just focus on understanding and enjoying the demos and uh, less about uh, the, the taking the photos from here. But when you do that, this will block the RDP connection for non-authenticated hosts, meaning uh, a Linux box with a socket in the wall, etc. but it will not prevent both the net and TLM and clear text, right? So uh, either way, when you do that, you are still losing because the password is exposed. The session is blocked maybe, but the password is exposed. What uh, is a better mitigation is to sadly work hard. And I know today it's the, the generation of Gen AI and people don't like to work hard. <laughs> But we used to uh, work very hard to get to, to somewhere and read a lot and code a lot. So you have to work hard. Sometimes you have to enroll certificates. Tough luck. So you have to enroll certificate to each and every server. And when you do that and you have a named certificate for every server, then it will disallow the connection. And it will, uh, of course, not only block the connection, but it also prevent the attacker from getting the uh, clear text password, right? Uh, pay attention that even when you do that, 
It will not prevent the net NTLM. Microsoft has big plans. It announced in last October, and it's beginning to do that in Windows 11 to uh, depreciate, uh, deprecate, sorry, and also not to appreciate <laughs> NTLM, right? That they are going to essentially build the KDC in every uh, uh, client operating system. It will be interesting to see how this works out. Next, the second topic I want to demonstrate about is about understanding changes, but very fast. Uh, and this is about uh, Active Directory, uh, the most common uh, centralized identity management in the world still, even with all the cloud. It's not going anywhere. It's the Microsoft mainframe. It's here to last. And you'll be seeing it in 2030 and more years. So Active Directory forensics are actually a tough one, right? Who is running uh, within an Active Directory domain or more or multiple <laughs> domains? Okay. There are a few here with the head nods. So sometimes, you know, this is a bedtime story. You can read it to your kids so they fall asleep. Uh, this is an incident, right? So you see failed logon, failed logon, failed logon, failed logon, failed logon, successful logon. Uh, then a user added to a security group, then process created, then security event log wiped, 1102. Uh, when you wipe system event log is 104, but they have different event IDs. So not all... Uh, incident response cases, which we tend to do a lot, sadly, uh, look like that. Not always do you have those breadcrumbs and you understand what happened. Many times the, the logs will get wiped or ransomed or you are not collecting even the right events. Uh, and I thought about it, how can I understand what happened in the environment months ago, even when there is no uh, retention data, that the SIM is not collecting or you didn't enable the audit logs, etc. So actually in Windows domains, inside Active Directory, you have uh, this data, but in a cryptic way, it's a, a byte of uh, a property called REPL property metadata. What this property is, it's every time you have a change on an object, so this blob gets updated on each and every object in Active Directory, and it gets stored on the Active Directory database. So even from a, an Active Directory uh, backup of the database, you can get uh, understanding of what happened. But there are two attributes that you can look at. They are not listed by default, but trust me, they are there. Uh, so I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice if I can just query back to the dawn of the domain and see everything that happened? And Microsoft doesn't have tools for that. So I created them so we can all enjoy them. Uh, so first of all, of all I uh, show you this user, Yossis, right? You can see it's a member of managers and domain users. So nothing really special about this user. But now I will run one of the scripts, uh, forensic scripts of AD that I want to show you. Uh, you can get uh, this replication of attribute metadata history. You can run it also in an offline environment or, or from a backup. You don't need to run it online. And you can see that once I run it, it gives me all the information about all past changes that happened to those objects that I wanted to query. So logon count is uh, the counter attributes for each time that you are logging on to Active Directory. There's actually something like that. Uh, the last logon, timestamp, the bad password count, bad password time, when was the last time the user entered a bad password. But you can also see, if we are looking uh, down back here, you can see that uh, there was a rename of the account on September uh, 23. Uh, but a bit more down there, there is also some interesting attributes that are changing. User workstations, lockout time. You can see it was released from a lockout, uh, right? It was unlocked at this and that particular time, added an SPN. But you can see in uh, 25 December 2018, the admin count was changed to one. Admin count. Uh, by default is empty and it changes to one only when you are added to a privileged group. So how can we know what happened in 2018? We'll probably say we can't, but you can. So this is the second script uh, I wrote, which is the analysis of the multi-vector replication attribute data. And this time I will ask to show all the history of the AD group changes uh, of this user to a grid. And you can see, you can clearly see now from the analysis of those bytes, that uh, blob, that uh, there is an indication this user was a member of administrators. 
And uh, this user, the last, last action that was done on this uh, group for this user was that it was removed uh, from the group, right? And you can see the date it was added and the date it was removed and the days since the last action, etc. So th these kind of things, um, they help you understand very fast what is happening in your domain, whether you have uh, other tools and even without using commercial tools, right? Uh, so those forensic scripts are essentially very good for defenders in an incident response or in understanding what's happening and to build a timeline of identities, who did what from where and when. But you can also use them as a red teamer. For example, uh, if you would put some uh, honey, honey pots and change stuff, as a red teamer you can always look at the history and see that this account was something different at some point in time. Uh, so you see this is the yin yang of a blue and red team. Everything you can use can be used against you. And that's, that's the beauty of the flip coin approach. But those scripts are available in GitHub. Uh, no special permission, no agent, and you can just download them. Let's talk about a myth. Uh, that you need a TCP IP connection for a command and control server. Do you think you need a TCP IP connection for a command and control to send commands or exfiltrate data, you have to be connected to a network? What do you think? Well, I would suggest that the command and control, I, I will show you one example out of many, uh, is not about TCP nor UDP. It's all about a mindset. Because a command and control is about sending the uh, commands that I want, having sort of keyboard access, and then getting back what I need. But nobody said anything about a connection. It doesn't even need to be based on any uh, permanent connection. How about your email client? I've done this with firewalls, with uh, rejected uh, dropped packets. I created uh, command and controls. We created uh, command and controls with the Bluetooth devices, whatever. But how about your email? So uh, this is uh, something we did many years back. But I'll just show you a quick example of that. Uh, turning your uh, Outlook uh, into a command and control interface. So here there is this uh, folder, including all types of documents, and there is Project X. Project X is a sensitive project, and I want to exfiltrate data about this project. And in the victim uh, PC, in the host of the victim, I see this uh, uh, Outlook uh, thing. Uh, and uh, you, you can see this client, the, it, this is the inbox, the scent is clear, etc. And now I will run this uh, small loop. It's a very simple uh, loop. You can actually uh, infect the client with that in phishing, drive-by installation, whatever. And now I go back to the uh, attacker uh, machine. And from the uh, attacker machine, I will, just, I will simply send the victim an email, but I will write in the email body the command that I want it to be. So essentially it will do a, an LS, uh, sorry, a dir to the files and filter by everything that has to do with project X. Uh, that's the command. Bring me any file you want, uh, you find with this sensitive project. And now going back to the victim, I deliberately uh, made it that it will uh, stick for a few seconds. Of course, this can be a millisecond. It will never show uh, to your site. You will never see it. Uh, and the sent mail is also empty. But now when I go back and refresh the adversary, uh, the attacker uh, email, so of course we got back from the Outlook command control, we got back the file. So I don't have any direct TCP connection and I could be working from a spoofed uh, mail domain or whatever and I can still make your uh, uh, client, your email client attack your network. So this begs the question, you know, all this RDP, IPC things to, you know, a deep question, to admin or not to admin? Uh, how can we admin well? So in, inside, uh, um, we have multiple tools to admin, especially in, in Microsoft environments, uh, PSExec, RDP, backslash, backslash, C dollar, whatever. Uh, and in the last years, I've done sort of a, a small uh, experiment, my, my research to map every time that there is a credential exposed on the target, meaning that somebody is managing a, a host and the credentials are exposed on the target host because of impersonation, because of caching, because hashes are uh, logged into LSAS, etc. 
And I found out very much to my pleasure that after I've been doing this for years, Microsoft last year, they took uh, the initiative and they actually created an article with all the uh, administrative tools and logon types and they mapped all the reusable credentials on destination, which is amazing. And I thought it's so uh, uh, thoughtful uh, from Microsoft to do that. And I read the document, but then I saw some things that were a bit interesting. For example, I saw PowerShell WinRM, logon type tree network, reusable credentials, none. And I said, but wait a minute, I can still get a full function in TGT using mm, this and that. And I kept on this document. I will show you one example of the, thing, the things I found. And this section is called why you should not trust Microsoft official documentation. So I will show you how you get a TGT, a full blown TGT, logon type tree without NTLM hash, without nothing. So this is the victim host. It's called Lone CL1, and if you look at the processes and you filter with unique users, you will see that uh, it does not include administrator, right? So you have system, etc. You have Adam, Kai, and drivers, uh, and I'm user Adam. Doesn't really matter. I will go to another machine, and from this machine, I will uh, run a PowerShell remoting, essentially WinRM, Windows Remote Management Connection. So now I'm connected with the built-in. Windows SSH, so-called, yeah? I don't know if you know PowerShell remoting, but if you don't, you should know. So now you can see I have a process with a user administrator. Okay, what can I do with that? So I will go to the Swiss Army knife of uh, credential dumping, Mimikets. I guess you know about Mimikets, right? So we'll do the usual uh, charade of going through a privilege debug and secure LSA uh, log on uh, passwords and I'll dump all the passwords uh, that it can find and all the hashes to a log file. Now, if I look in this log file, I don't find the word admin. Uh, and because I don't trust GUI, I will also do a cat to the file and grep. SLS is the partial grep. I will grep all the usernames. So you see there's no administrator. So up until this point in the demo, Microsoft is correct. Microsoft is simply correct, but there is architecture. You remember, the adversary mindset is use the architecture against the system. So I know there is a process and there is a primary token to the process. So now I'm going to do a simple token manipulation. I'm going to duplicate the primary token to a new process. And I can do that. So now I duplicated the token. I created a new process with the primary token of that WinRM session. And if I do a dir to the domain controller, it worked, right? And if I do a, a K list, right, to do to see the uh, the, the TGTs, uh, I, I actually got a administrator access. But wait. Microsoft will say there is a potential mitigation. You, you used it wrong, right? There is virtual accounts. Virtual accounts are a really nice protection because what they give you is the ability to uh, create, when you create a PowerShell uh, remote session, you can actually configure a PS session configuration because PowerShell learned from all the great technologies before it, from a bash, C uh, self scripts, etc. It took all the good things. So also it took the uh, running this type of uh, uh, remote session configuration, you have run virtual account equal true. And what this means is that essentially, I will just run through this demo a bit because of time. This means that when I will run into a secure configuration uh, and I will try to uh, duplicate the token, so the token will uh, be actually now, the token of that process will be a WinRM virtual user account. So even if I spawn a new token, I'm showing you now with a different tool, doesn't really matter. The token that will be created is essentially uh, of the uh, virtual account. And this means that it is limited to this box. But then again, if you are an adversary on that box, what really creates the uh, a virtual account is a, a text file, conf configuration text file. So you can actually just rename this to dollar false and the mitigation is gone. But wait, you say as a defender, right? Let's keep this cat and mouse thing going. You can actually monitor 
for file and configuration changes, you can sign the config file, monitor for the hash change, right? You can do that as a blue teamer. Will you do that as a blue teamer? This is the actual adversary response that you assign all the files, monitor for changes, respond to it. So bottom line is, it's a bit complicated sometimes, but only when doing this cat and mouse back and forward, uh, having the red mindset, but the blue heart, you can actually really help organizations to improve. So key takeaways, understanding the adversary mindset can really make or break a successful or unsuccessful cyber attack. It doesn't matter if it's uh, using the built-in tools, command and control channels, whatever. Time is essentially the most important measurement that you can use in cybersecurity. Buy yourself time to help detect and delay your attacker to be able to do your processes more effectively. And be aware sometimes that documentation is uh, not really correct because it's all about the mindset and the architecture and not what about it's written in an official paper of the vendor, right? Uh, so I think that's about it. Ah, and remember, everything in the world is a set of nested if statements, including ChatGPT, including everything. Don't let them fool you. It's the same nested if statements. Cheers, Kosanem. <laughs> Think we're good on time for. Uh, Thank you, Yossi. Uh, as Yossi mentioned, his presentation will be made available shortly. Uh, is there any quick question? we turn for one. If something does occur to you, please approach Yossi during the yeah. rest of the day. 30 minutes left to buy a t-shirt. Now it's lunchtime and the presentations will begin this afternoon at exactly 1.15. Thank you and enjoy your lunch.